good evening for our audiences in Istanbul and good morning to Arizona. Um, welcome to the launch of Global Transformation uh, ASU Bilgi Talk Series. My name is Aslı Tunç. I'm a professor of media studies and communication and uh, also the vice director at Istanbul Bilgi University. It's such an honor to be introducing uh, Professor Craig Calhoun, uh, the world's leading sociologist and one of the most inspiring intellectuals. And I'm pleased to say that he is a great friend of Bilgi and Turkey. Um, what a great way to mark two universities, uh, Arizona State and Bilgi's academic collaboration by bringing Craig Calhoun, professor of social sciences at ASU and Asaf Savaş Akat, professor of economics and first rector of Bilgi. Uh, before leaving the floor to two old friends, please allow me to present some highlights of their academic lives. Craig Calhoun is currently affiliated with School of Sustainability, College of Global Futures, Arizona State University. Previously, he was director of the London School of Economics and Political Science, president of Social Science Research Council, and a professor at NYU, Columbia, and UNC Chapel Hill. His work focuses on strengthening the ability of the social sciences, working together with the natural sciences and humanities to address the most complex challenges facing society today. Challenges ranging from the shifting nature of globalization to the future of uh, place-based communities and of democracy, the complicated social and ethical issues raised by new technologies and the new need for creativity, solidarity and determination in order to achieve sustainable futures. He has published 10 books and some 150 articles and chapters in social theory and comparative and historical research on social movements, forms of social solidarity, knowledge, institutions, uh, and political economy. Among the best known are Neither Gods Nor Emperors, Students and the Struggle for Democracy in China, and Nations Matter, Citizenship, Solidarity, and the Cosmopolitan Dream. His work has been translated into 21 languages. Calhoun's forthcoming book, The Generations of Democracy, will be published by Harvard University Press. Asaf Savaş Akat, professor of economics, began his career in 1966 at Istanbul's Faculty of Economics, following his education at Istanbul University and the University of East Anglia. He also acquired many important roles in professional life, Following the military coup in 1980, Akkad quit academic life in 1982 and joined the private sector, working in different management positions. He became a member of the board of one of the Turkey's largest companies, Edzajubashi Holding, which is active in several sectors. He still holds this post. In 1989, Akkad returned to academia and started to lecture at Marmara University in Istanbul. He also became politically active in 1993, he co-founded the New Democracy Movement, a reformist liberal political party. He is the author of many publications and three books on economic issues. Well, the topic of the conversation today will be thoughts on resilience of societies, social and political impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Please welcome Craig Calhoun and Asaf Savashakat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Asla. Well, it's, uh, it's an immense pleasure, actually, to see this uh, cooperation between uh, Arizona State and, uh, and Bilgi. Craig is familiar with Bilgi, who uh, have been here uh, at, uh, at the Central. Uh, I'm one of the lucky people who had uh, the, the, the good fortune of uh, listening to Craig alive. You know, once upon a time, we used to see one another uh, you know, uh, we meet and, you know, we sort of got in physical contact with one another. Uh, it was one of those, one of those times. Uh, and uh, it's always been, uh, it's always been uh, very stimulating. It's, uh, what, it's, what he has to say it has always been very stimulating. Uh, though I have not been able to keep up with, with the last work. The last one I'm very familiar is the future of capitalism. Uh, you know, which I both read and uh, I would also listen to uh, present that in, in Delhi. Uh, okay, uh, obviously, uh, you know, this is the topic of today. 
uh, were, and uh, many things which are happening now are not due solely to the COVID pandemic. I mean, clearly there were uh, there were disagreeable trends, or sort of unwanted trends, which had appeared some of them long before even COVID. You know, we, we think about the inequality issues, both of income and and uh, and wealth. We think about all the environment, environmental problems, uh, global warming. It's very difficult to claim that either of these problems are due to COVID. Uh, there was the rise of the rise of populism uh, is again predates the COVID. Uh, Trump was elected uh, a few years before uh, COVID. Uh, there's been the, the 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 difficult global issues. Uh, caused by the rise of China, uh, a, a sort of a economic power, uh, but with very authoritarian uh, government and how, how it would fit into the world. So, you know, all these things. But in the end, COVID came. <laughs> On top of it all, it came and then it, it certainly uh, has already uh, left some deep marks into all our societies, not not just the developed world or the developing world, but also the global inter their, their global interactions. So, you know, now that we have someone who's who knows these things well, we we can listen from the horse's mouth as to uh, how how things are, are are going. The first the first thing that I think everybody wonders is especially. How could this thing get really out of hand and evolve the way it did evolve in the U.S.? I mean, we, it, it, because you know well, but also in the other parts of the developed world. Normally, we would have expected the developed world with supposedly strong state capacities, you know, with efficient governments, etc., to cope with it. But it's, it's, it, this has not been the case. So, you know, I like to hear start by taking your reactions. Uh, your ideas, your opinions on that, your thoughts on that, Greg. Okay, great. Thanks, Asaf. And thank you, Asli, for the nice introduction. And it's a pleasure to be part of this um, cooperation between ASU and Bill Guy. Um, but it's very disappointing not to be in Istanbul for this occasion. <laughs> and, um, nonetheless, um, let's proceed. So we are not in Istanbul because we have this pandemic, or we are not together in Istanbul because we have this pandemic. And um, it has affected so much, including travel, um, but also including the way states have managed travel and managed their borders. So I want to begin by saying that Asaf is exactly right to present the COVID pandemic not as something by itself, but as a factor in a set of larger and broader relationships, a factor in international relationships, a factor in um, government and um, state um, operations and capacity, a factor in um, economic um, organization and change. So um, we really will only understand it well when we combine biomedical understanding uh, with the uh, economic and social and other dimensions of this. You ask about um, a key question, uh, really two key questions. How did this happen? And why did it have such huge effects in many of the world's richer countries where um, we expect state capacity to be much greater? So let me answer each very briefly. So first, the explanation of why it got started in China is a different story, right? There's a um, epidemiological biomedical component with regard to animal to human transmission and why are there live markets and how are they regulated? There's a political or governance story about um, why local officials were either afraid to tell national officials or um, repressed um, when they did tell national officials, and that slowed the Chinese response. But there's also a state capacity story that when China responded, it was able to mobilize enormous capacity very effectively um, to bring the um, uh, 
pandemic, the really epidemic in China, almost to a standstill. There are occasionally still outbreaks and so forth. But this did not happen before um, the international transmission, which is what made it a pandemic, before there were enough flights out of Wuhan um, and other connections that took it globally. So our first point is this became a pandemic because we have a global infrastructure that connects us all. Something that in many ways we like, because we like to be able to travel ourselves or we like to be able to buy things that come from other countries, um, turned out to be a vehicle for the transmission of disease. Um, it had been predicted for some time, and we need to remember this, that there would be this kind of problem, that there would be coming pandemics. So the, there are always new diseases. There are always new infections and varieties. The question is when they take off and go to these numbers and when, how they spread. The, uh, and the vulnerability of our global system to this has been discussed. So that raises a different question, which is why was not very much attention paid to the warnings, since there were fairly clear warnings from epidemiologists and from others about this potential. And um, I won't try to give a speech explaining all the elements, but there's everything from the questions of trust in science to the nature of government decision-making and policy to a kind of tyranny of the short-term. Um, in both the private sector and governance, we have more capacity to solve this week's problems than to lay the foundation for addressing longer term needs. Um, we are really governed by very short term considerations um, in the private sector by quarterly profit results or even um, shorter term um, attempts to look at all of this and the way markets work. Um, it's a big issue. Now, how did this happen in the US, in Europe at such large scale? Um, the first bit of the story is the rich countries are among the most densely interconnected into this global system and set of networks. And it's not just the movement of people. Of course, travelers often brought this. It's the supply chains um, of industry and commerce. And a lot of the traffic out of China had to do with the movement of things accompanied by people, not just by the movement of people. Right, so um, shipping networks, supply networks. This feeds into the economic consequences because a lot of the recession is not because we can't go to cafes and so waiters and waitresses are out of employment, but because supply chains have been disrupted and, um, and manufacturing and shipping of goods has been disrupted. Um, in the case of the uh, spread into the US, a crucial factor was unwillingness to acknowledge that this was important and attempts simply to blame it on China. Um, we can talk about the previous US administration, which shares a lot of blame. Um, and I um, agree that we need to recognize the damage done by that administration. But we also need to see that there was a wider um, US willingness to think this was something we weren't very vulnerable to, coming from outside and we had system to take care of it. So um, the US didn't respond very fast. In particular, it didn't look at this in terms of high vulnerability uh, institutions and settings like nursing homes and elder care. Um, it didn't look very quickly at the vulnerability of our healthcare system. So I'll pause for a moment to say something about the healthcare system. First, it had privatized a lot um, in recent decades. Second, the operation of the private system and some of the public system on criteria of that are close to private um, goals, that is efficiency and cost margins and so forth, meant that the healthcare system had changed. It had invested much less in emergency rooms and much less in the kind of treatment that the COVID virus would require than it had in elective surgeries, which were higher profit margin, um, and high technology medicine, 
which was higher profit margin. Um, and in just-in-time supplies, I mentioned supply chains. Well, the US found itself unable to supply even nurses, let alone the general public, with masks and other personal protective equipment. That's because the US had stopped manufacturing them and come to import them largely from China, right? So we complain, ah, this disease came from China, but in fact, we were completely dependent on China for much of the personal protective equipment needed to deal with the disease and supply chains were disrupted. The health system didn't have reserves um, because it was worried about short-term questions of profit or economic efficiency, not about long-term public health. And finally, I'll turn it back to you, we simply didn't worry very much about public health. Um, there is some public health infrastructure in the US. Budgets have been cut in recent years. The US spends more than almost any other country in the world on health, but it spends it almost entirely on um, individualized um, health care and treatment in a curative model or in very expensively keeping people alive in the last years of their um, lives, not in securing public health, which would have a broader impact on that. That's tied to issues of inequality and um, other problems in the country and to a general trend of neoliberal privatization, but it needs to be seen here. We have an amazing health care sector if you need a certain kind of operation but a problematic public health system. Our last comment is the story is a bit different in Europe where the public health systems are better. They're not, they've been cut, budgets been cut, for example, in Britain's National Health Service, but there are strong institutions. There were some problems with governmental decision-making and how this was managed. We can come back to that, but we see um, both the good and the bad in something like Britain's current success in rolling out vaccines, which has almost nothing to do with the political government and everything to do with the National Health Service, and the difficulties on the continent of Europe, which have mostly to do with government cooperation and weaknesses in government cooperation. So let me turn it back to you before I continue into a longer and longer speech. <laughs> okay, well, you know, you're right. Obviously, uh, you know, Britain uh, had great problems in the beginning, mainly due to political <coughs> political decision making. Erroneous, you know, was the, the decision making was was simply uh, inadequate, uh, not prepared. Uh, whereas, you know, also France, for example, which has an excellent uh, excellent uh, health system. Uh, public health system nevertheless had difficulties in containing the thing. Uh, another issue which which comes, of course, is the sort of uh, co compared to China, is the uh, is the individualistic uh, yeah. Western uh, sort of uh, citizen attitude, whereby this was evident not in the U.S. but also in in, in England, in France, where the citizen refused this containment and uh, and limitations on their on their daily life, on their what, which they consider as infringement on their on their uh, freedoms, you know, basic freedoms sort of thing. Okay, that there's there's no doubt about that. But uh, you know, uh, one of the things that comes to mind, looking looking more more towards the future, you know, today and towards the future, one aspect of the one of the consequences of the of the of this crisis. Uh, that the that the pandemic. So I'm not going to say economic, but it's an you know, overall crisis. I mean, this is a this is turned into a almost societal crisis with at all levels, politics, administration, uh, and everything, all levels. Uh, it, it may change many people's you know ideas, opinions about the relation between the market and and the states. You know. They, you know, typically in the U.S. case, the importance of public health system, uh, you know, and also uh, competition versus cooperation. Sort of these are issues which which I know are being discussed. Uh, all this competitive market-based society in one hand, in one hand, as opposed to more cooperative, where there is a more technocratic, you know, 
well-meaning but efficient, nevertheless, state capacity, uh, state intervention. What do you what do you think? I mean, do, do we get a feeling about how things will evolve uh, from this? How how pandemic will affect the uh, market, state, government intervention, okay. cooperation, go back. The co cooperation, competition, sort of uh, trade-offs facing the modern world. Let me go back to your first point and just use things like mask wearing as an example, right? There is a cultural factor, and you correctly point to societies in which people are more willing to um, cooperate in the pursuit of public health by things like mask wearing. And that means partly being more compliant with government directives and so forth. So I think there's a cultural component and that extends into this issue of whether we think of markets as freedom, um, as many in the United States and in the West do. And they say, oh, we, the free market, we want market. So market is all freedom. And it seems to me there's a one-sided emphasis on that. Freedom is indeed a dimension of the kind of markets that we've developed, but um, extremely um, unequal distribution of property limits the freedom of many people and um, creates various uh, desires for some way to find or express freedom um, that uh, are important. So I think we have a, a peculiar and a distorted cultural understanding of freedom that gets in the way sometimes um, and uh, has been a big factor in how the COVID virus has intersected with politics in the United States, right? So we famously had the January 6th um, insurrection and invasion of the Capitol that wasn't directly about COVID, um, but in the background was the accentuated desire somehow to have freedom from people who felt they were losing freedom and who uh, may have blamed various things, including government actors that told them to wear masks and so forth. So that's one thing. But second thing, I think you are, are asking correctly a long-term question. Um, how is this changing our societies? Not just what caused the outbreak, but what's it doing to us? And here I would make an example of another dimension of compliance in mask wearing or temperature taking or other public health measures, and this is surveillance. Um, the Chinese government was effective partly because it had the capacity to use um, not just technological, but in general, lots of surveillance of citizen behavior. The US government was less effective, partly because it didn't do that. It didn't set up sentinel surveillance early on to monitor where people who are exposed were going and, and do all of that, partly because of the ideology of freedom. But overall, the impact in the US, and I think in Europe and in much of the world, is a dramatic acceleration in surveillance. Um, faced with the insecurity that the pandemic has brought us, people are um, taking on board um, more and more surveillance. Well, this is also a longer trend, not just specific to the pandemic. We have been seeing more and more surveillance for years, both state surveillance as the government monitors everyone's email or social media or um, political protests or other things, but um, a kind of private sector surveillance, what Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism that exists in the monitoring of credit card reports and GPS data and all kinds of other information about people and its mobilization in machine learning um, as the basis for technologies designed to get us to place orders on Amazon or in other ways get us to um, help corporations make profits. Well, the pandemic feeds into this. It is um, accelerating the extent to which we are going to be subject to all kinds of surveillance, I think. And it's increasing a demand for effective government regulation of that. Well, what surveillance is okay? What surveillance is not okay? How do we make sure that the people doing the surveillance respect the privacy of citizens or the political rights of citizens or the human rights of everyone. Um, and we have very weak institutions to do that. We have simply not 
evolved our capacity to govern surveillance anywhere near as fast as the surveillance has increased. Okay. Yes, thank you. That, I fully agree. I mean, you know, the, 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 all these issues about privacy with the, you know, profit making, the, 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 you know, the Google, the alphabets, sort of, you know, the Google's uh, alphabets and uh, uh, Amazon's and uh, Apple's and whatnot, and Microsoft and Facebook, <laughs> sort of story, all the, all the information they collect. Plus, on top of that, the additional surveillance now, which is coming, uh, you know, it's really bizarre things are happening. I mean, you know, things that would be difficult to, to imagine, uh, you know, countries are uh, sort of developed countries, the, 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 uh, the, where the, you know, the original founders of, 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 of democracy, republic and whatnot, for example, can constrain their citizens from going abroad. I mean, there's, there are travel bans. <laughs> you know, they say just simply, you, you know, you cannot go. Not, not that if you go, these will be the consequences or not. Simply, you cannot go and, 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 and it seems to be accepted. So in the same way, surveillance will be, uh, is, will be increased. And, and that is clearly, uh, it's going to be a very touchy subject. That kind of increase in state power, uh, power of surveillance. And obviously, the next question is, how can we democratically keep it in check, you know, keep it under control. How, how to do it, uh, you know, that's not easy. But, but, you know, continuing from the, you know, looking at it again from a global perspective, which you always do. Uh, by the way, I like, I, I would like to congratulate you because I, uh, I, I know that you've been elected to the, uh, what is it, uh, the oversight panel of the Council of uh, uh, International Science Councils, COVID-19 project, you know, uh, that's uh, that's the scenario project. So, you know, looking at it from an international, really global perspective, how do you think this will affect the relations between the developed world, the emerging world, the underdeveloped world, you know, Africa, for example, where the, where the really poor countries, and what can be done? Is there anything that we can do? What can be done about that? Yeah. Um, well, the short answer, Asaf, is the trends are not good, but we do have some capacity to change them. Um, the uh, vaccine distribution is an example of this, but all there are a variety of these. So we've organized the production of vaccines largely by government subs in the West, largely by government subsidies to private corporations. Then it turns out some of those private corporations are willing to distribute the vaccines at cost to poor countries in Africa or other parts of the developing world. Some of those corporations insist on a high profit margin. And the contracts that were given them by the government didn't regulate this effectively. So a first message is if we want to do better, we have to think better up front and act better and not let the contracts be regulated by people who are, are agreed to, by people who are either careless or have a vested interest in the businesses that are involved. Um, and um, I think, you know, it's a, a glaring difference. So then you look at vaccines coming from Russia or coming from elsewhere outside the West. I think eventually India will be a major supplier in this. And we see a repeat of something we saw with the HIV AIDS crisis and with other kinds of areas. The tension between generic availability of vaccines at relatively low cost so that the quantity can be ramped up quickly and um, high profit availability of vaccines which in principle underwrites their research and development. So we've got a system in which um, we fund the development out of profit, but the profit margins turn out to make the products highly exclusive. So they can only go to people 
who are personally rich or in rich countries or with good insurance programs, or, and this is an international feature that's important, who work for certain big corporations. So it turns out that the big corporations, who often look like problems in international relations, are also big helps to the people who work for them. Um, you know, in South Africa, 10 years ago, having the AIDS um, treatment programs basically meant you worked for multinational capital, um, for international firms that were able to offer them to their employees. Um, you know, so there's that. Now, all of these things introduce new inequalities, though inequalities among countries, people who work for this kind of company or that kind of company and so forth. And they have a particular impact in regard to infectious diseases. So whatever we think of this as a matter of justice with regard to all the inequality and who gets treated in what country and who individually gets treated, it's also a matter of efficacy because we only are able to defeat the pandemic if we can get something like two thirds of the population um, vaccinated, right? So the irony here is the way we pay for the vaccines becomes an enemy of getting the vaccines to enough people. And our privatized notion of protecting ourselves by getting vaccinated um, is in tension with our need for a public solution because we remain vulnerable um, as long as the majority of people are not vaccinated. Um, and this is true inside a country like the US where the distribution of vaccines is extremely unequal. So we look on the one hand, how well are we doing? What percentage? But on the other hand, there are large concentrated populations that are under vaccinated. And this creates then risk factors with new variants and potential new waves of the a vaccine and potentially vaccines that lose their efficacy because a great danger with vaccines is if you don't manage to defeat the disease, then the disease develops resistance to the vaccines that you have. And exactly. so there's no solution that doesn't involve getting the vast majority of the population vaccinated to bring down the disease. Now, it probably will not eliminate COVID it will bring it down to something like what we have with the flu that is a more or less manageable level, but not completely vanquished. And even that depends on vaccines and so forth. So it's key that we develop better ways of getting for-profit drugs made in generic form for wide distribution at potentially, you know, there's still some profit, but a low enough profit margin that the, the enormous scale can be met, the needs for millions and millions of doses of these vaccines. This is a problem of international cooperation. Um, and it's a problem of the tensions between the private market and the public sector. A last point on the international cooperation part though is at this moment when we need the World Health Organization, we face two problems. Sometimes it's not quite as good as we want it to be, but instead of improving it, we get countries like the United States under yeah. the previous um, administration, attacking it, pulling funding out and saying, we're going to go it alone. Now, um, there's lots to be said about the US nationalism of the last few years, but it's actually a trend around the world for countries to think they can go it alone, to be nationalist, to undermine institutions of global cooperation. Remember back to my comment about supply chains. We are more connected than ever in terms of our material interdependency in our economies, but we have moved backwards in terms of our international capacities to cooperate and manage all of this. Yes, very true. Uh, there's. You know, I've got. I'm going to move to 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 another thing. There is uh, there is there's one thing which sort of intrigues me a lot uh, is that uh, yeah, you know the, the question is have we learned anything from this pandemic? I mean, because uh, I, in a sense, human societies are used to uh, you know creating <clears throat> very excess, very large capacities which are unused in normal times, uh, but then in the, in the tail 
probability event, very low probability event, what they, you know, sort of black swan sort of situation, that capacity is needed. I, I, I immediately think of the armies and the military spending. I mean, think of all the, think of all the uh, military equipment worth trillion, trillion, trillions of dollars, which are basically not used. And the idea is to not use them. But when it comes to health, uh, as you correctly pointed out, there was absolutely no excess capacity for a, a tail event, which uh, experts warned us was about to happen. You you also probably know the story of the French minister who in 2004, a French health minister who 2004 and five or something like that decided to build a large stock uh, against. Uh, some sort of uh, pandemic, and then he was. She was laughed at, you know. And then she, she, the poor thing, had to resign, saying, you know, why are you spending people the, the money of, of of the of the taxpayer for such a thing, which will not be used unless there is a pandemic, which is low probability. So, so you know, have we learned anything? I mean, looking forward, the, the will the government. Uh, both at the national level, but as you made very clear, uh, more and more, much more at the international level, at the level of international coordination, be prepared to take measures for the next new virus, because it's clear that you know here and there something new will come out. Yeah. How 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 much have we learned from this horrid experience? Well, not enough. So let me, I mean, my general answer is, have we learned? No. Oh. Uh, now I can make that more complicated. It depends on who we are. If we are talking about professors in schools of public health, you know, they've learned a lot. Epidemiologists have learned a lot. Some social scientists learned a lot. But if we are talking about the extent to which that specialist knowledge is translated into effective government policymaking or effective public understanding of the issues, on both of those dimensions, um, no. Um, and there are blocks to this. It's not just knowledge and learning, it's changing institutions. So um, to stockpile for resilience, to create investments against black swan events requires changing institutions. It's not just a matter of what people know, um, it's a matter of how institutional decision-making works. and. Um, so we have established strong traditions of funding militaries, as you support, against one kind of risk that we are very conscious of. And part of the issue is that we conceptualize that risk powerfully. We might be invaded, um, even if it's improbable. Um, and we have a vague conceptualization of the risk from disease. But part of the matter is that we've simply built up the military as an institution over generations. Um, so we have lots of veterans and they become legislatures. We have um, groups in the military that lobby for better equipment or more funding or something. So it's an institution. It's an institution that is established, that we are familiar with. I won't try to give an outsider's comment on Turkey, but obviously the military has been a very important institution. Um, and these institutions do more than just prepare for that potential risk. They employ people, they train people, they um, have economic effects in the short run um, as well. So we haven't focused on building the institutions that we need. Um, we can turn it to universities and say, well, the universities do research that is crucial to this learning. We do a wonderful job. How well do we do at incorporating that into our teaching? Um, are we doing enough to help change understanding and in the broader public, our graduates? And are we doing enough to educate people who will be the government decision makers in how the institutions need to change in order to be effective for all of this? And I think the answer is um, we're trying, but we're trying with lots of other distractions and stresses because the pandemic has caused problems. Those universities, many universities had to go online and there are financial implications to that. And universities are already under pressure financially and otherwise. So it's not so easy to say we should do this new thing. Um, and we have the faculty that we have and it takes some years to change them and so forth. So the, 
you know, the universities are a good case in point. I think we are crucial. I think we do very important work. But I think if we are not continually rethinking what we do in this context, um, that there are risks that we, we greatly underperform. Um, so, you know, your point is exactly right about reserves and resilience. You know, Christians and Jews would trace this to the story of Pharaoh um, and whether he's set by um, stores of grain and the discussions of Moses. There are, in fact, in almost every religious tradition, stories like that. Um, because one of the things these traditions have exhorted is prudence, not just efficiency, right? So within Islam, within Buddhism, within every religious tradition, there are teachings that amount to prudence. There are teachings that amount to giving a fraction of what you earn or of your wealth to charity, to care for others, or zakat or whatever. And um, it's interesting that these are teachings in religion that appear as moral exhortations, but are not translated effectively always into our institutions, into government and so forth. So we, we, we have them in religion, but we don't always listen to them. We think it's a sort of private individual choice again. How do you live up to that? And I want to, to close this by saying that you mentioned a word we should come back to, which is scale. Much of how we think about this involves how it would work in face-to-face -face relationships or local communities. And yet the scale is enormous. It's transnational. We are the, doing what we're doing right now as a case in point. It happens that you and I have known each other for years, um, Asaf, which makes it, and Asli and I have known each other for fewer years, because she's really young. Um, but the prior knowledge of each other is now translated into an ability to talk to each other on Zoom. And we do lots of our work on Zoom. It's a completely different thing to make new relationships on Zoom. And again, we have to learn how to connect what we think about and love in personal relationships and face-to-face -face engagements to our understanding and our communication at very large scale. And I think we haven't really caught up to the scale at which things are organized and to the, you know, how to connect the local to the global. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, I love the way you, you tell these things uh, and, uh, you know, very, very inspiring, I must say. But uh, uh, I know, you know, economists, professional, by the professional deformation, they like to do forecasts, you know, where, because whenever people, you know, the man in the street, whenever he sees an economist, he's going to ask him what's going to be the inflation, the growth rate, uh, uh, external deficit, unemployment rate, you know, the, in the future, not today. So uh, I know social scientists don't like to do that, but I mean, you are now also an economist in a sense, you're fluent, uh, as fluent as I am in economics. Uh, so uh, I like to get uh, you know get to the sort of forecast of it, uh, you know the next I don't know quarter next year next few years uh, how this this whole COVID business uh, overall not just the economy social political with all implications uh, how it's going to evolve where do you see tension building okay. up. Where do you see, do you see any inflection points in, uh, in culture, in identity politics, in populism, in, in economics, uh, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Can you, I don't know if we have enough time, but I think we have a few more minutes. Uh, us to do, we do have a few more minutes, I presume. So uh, yes, we'd, we'd, we'd love to hear uh, what Craig thinks uh, about the, the, the future. Well, let me let me try. The bad news is that this is going to go on for quite a while, and so we will be able to have more conversations and work out the things that we don't discuss today. Um, but let me try to take you up directly um, uh, with the cautionary note that you mentioned the 
um, International Science Council project on long-term implications. Well, it's just starting, right? And um, and it's starting because of a need to bring together people with different kinds of knowledge to figure this out. Um, and um, so we're working. So we have um, you know, government, private sector, academics, people coming from biomedicine, people coming from economics and so forth. So. Um, as our knowledge emerges, what are going to be the issues? So in every case, these are inflection points. These are not dictates, but almost a dictate at the beginning. It's at least two years before we are out of the version of this crisis we are in now. And by crisis, I mean the biomedical crisis. I mean the economic crisis. And I mean the social crises linked to it. Um, Things may get better in a few months, but we will not be out of this COVID era sooner than um, uh, two years from now. So there's a concrete prediction with a timeline. But you, you're, um, saying, you're saying and to 2022, basically. When... 2022, 2023. Okay. Uh, so now it depends again on who the we is. So some countries will have majority vaccination um, later this year. And that will move them forward towards, quote, getting out of it. Um, but even there, um, there will be still further issues. We're worried about variants. We're worried about fourth spikes. We're worried about other things. But let us assume, taking the U.S. as an example, that we stay on track and we have reached something like the 60-70% um, target by late in 2001, which is not impossible if we, you know, we can, we can reach this target. That begins a process of eliminating the disease. It doesn't end and complete that process. So we still have questions about whether people will take other public health measures enough to keep transmitting. We have unknowns, like do people who have been vaccinated have the capacity to still spread the disease in some way? Do people who have already had the disease have immunity about against getting it again when it's a new variant? If the Brazil variant or the British variant or something is spreading, is there a risk of a re-exposure? Right. So there are a lot of questions. And I'm just saying, I, I think it would be a big surprise to me if we had answered those questions and got out of this, even biomedically, before 2023. Um, I think things can get better in the meantime, but not out of it. Then you add the international comparisons, right? Well, if the global community doesn't get its act together and make vaccines available in the less developed world, then it is just creating a place for the virus to grow, to come back in possibly new evolved forms and variants. So, you know, there really, it isn't possible. This is the very beginning of the story. As effective as China was in containing the virus in China, it got out and went global. It's very hard to manage this one country at a time. And um, the only way that can happen even with China is with a really draconian, enormous application of government force that democratic countries are reluctant to embrace. So um, let's look economically. Um, we are in you know, arguably a, a sort of COVID recession. It's mostly a COVID response recession. Um, that is, um, the direct economic impacts come more from the public health measures we've taken, um, social distancing, closing um, shops and restaurants, disrupted supply chains, then from infections as such, but they come from both. Um, and it's going to be hard to work out of this. So there's a lot of economic debate, as you know. Will there be a new boom? As soon as the disease is under control, will there be an economic boom because so many people go back to work, so many people want to buy things, whatnot? Now, I don't have a crystal ball for that. Um, and, and really, no, most economists don't imagine they do either, only the ones who are on TV. Um, but the... Um, but let me point to a couple of the questions about it and pattern. Um, the phrase COVID recession is misleading. If you are an owner of investable assets, this pandemic has been good for you. You made money. 
If you fantastic, just invest, not good, fantastic, fantastic. fantastic it right? makes a so lot of money. If and and one of the ways to look at society is people who work for a living versus people who have investable assets. Now, so there's a middle people who work for a living and have some investable assets for their retirement. There's a rich class of people who live mainly from their investable assets. Um, what we've seen is dramatic, fantastic, as you say, wonderful returns for those investments. And not just to brilliantly picking the right company, the person who bought stock in Zoom before we all started using it, or at AstraZeneca or something, um, across broad parts of asset markets. There's been huge, huge increases. That has not happened in the so-called real economy of people who work for a living. And so we've seen an increase in inequality between wealth and work as, as basic dimensions of the economy. And that's a split. So it, you know, we can't just say, oh, a recession. We have to say for whom, in what way. Yeah. This has been terrible for service workers because service establishments were among the first to close. It's been better for what you might call logistics workers who in official economic statistics are often classed with service workers, but it's different to work in an Amazon warehouse or in a delivery service than it is to work in a restaurant. You probably lost your job in the restaurant. Amazon is trying to hire more people, right? Um, so there's a whole sector we might think of as logistics and um, that sector is doing well. So we're going to need to look in a complicated way across economies at this, but the dominant feature of this separation between assets um, and the rest of the economy, um, I think is powerful. Um, there's a related issue, which is tech industry and the big tech companies versus the rest of um, even the corporate and asset world. So through almost all of this pandemic until the, even the last week, um, it has been a safe bet to buy Alphabet and Apple and Microsoft and all the big tech companies. There's now a downturn and a kind of reaction, even an anger, there are government threats to uh, try to do things. Um, now you wanted a forecast, I'm gonna bet on the tech companies, not the governments. Um, and say that <laughs> mostly they stay rich and powerful, that governments may regulate them a little more, they may tax them a little more, but they will stay rich and powerful. And, um, and that's a change in society. And uh, without taking too much time to go into it, we often just think of business, like there's a business sector, but it's a really different business to own a local cafe. Um, than it is to um, be the president of, of Microsoft. Um, and the large corporations, which are vital to our economy, right, are crucial in many ways to what we do, are a really different sector from small businesses. And we need to look at things like when stimulus investments come from governments, um, when we invest in new resilience in healthcare, are we investing only in ways that benefit the big businesses? or are we also benefiting small businesses? In the US, stimulus and investment packages that have been offered so far have gone mostly to fairly big business. Even the things that were intended for small businesses officially were snapped up by big businesses. Oh, it's for individual restaurants. Well, a chain of restaurants with a thousand restaurants can get some of the same deal, right? So we need to be paying attention to this difference. A last difference, the legal and illegal economy, licit and illicit. Um, big difference between those with access to tax havens and those who pay taxes. Um, we often think of the informal sector as though it is um, very small business people selling something on the street, or maybe they are repairing your car and you're paying them in cash to avoid the tax man. Um, and they're traders in markets in Africa. Um, but there's a very big informal sector um, of uh, tax evasion through tax havens and through various economic vehicles, mm -hmm. extremely poorly regulated. I mean, basically the rich and powerful governments of the world have not tried. Um, and um, even though they have a vested interest in getting the tax income, they haven't pushed very hard because the people who benefit from this are very powerful. And that 
has two effects. One is the governments don't have enough money to pay for the public needs because they aren't collecting the taxes. And two, the money in these illicit tax evading um, operations mingles with more severely illegal capitalism, yeah. the worlds of trafficking in guns um, and drugs Affiliate. and people, and has an effect on the banking sector and all of this. Um, so, um, that's distant from COVID, but that's very central to how we will recover, whether we will recover in ways that improve this situation um, or in ways that make it worse. Oh, that's, thank you. Uh, you know, at this point, normally, uh, I, you, you maybe think about of, of the wealth tax. I mean, you know, uh, somewhere along the line, sure. maybe, you know, but we have questions. Uh, Skan Yulmaz, as asked, like you can see it probably also on, on your chat, the pandemic also creates negative effects in the field of education. What kind of policy should be followed in the near and long term? What kind of investment should be made in the field of education in order to be prepared for another pandemic situation in the future? And then we have another question by Diane Sunar. Maybe if you quickly answer uh, Skani Elmas first, then we, we will want to Diane. Fine. Um, I'm I'm happy to. So let me say first on the education question that there's no one size fits all answer because education systems in different countries and all this are very different. Um, one thing we learn is I mean, one dimension of our learning is around face to face and online. And so, so we've um, ramped up our learning to do things online. And this is mostly good. Um, it's not the same. All of us who are university professors who used to teach small in-person seminars um, miss that kind of contact. But that could only reach a small number of students. If we are talking about reaching large numbers of people and creating access, then we have to be including online education at higher education, even at secondary levels. So for access and equity, um, this learning is important. However, um, especially in earlier stages of education, there is no substitute for face-to-face -face education, right? If you have um, small children um, at home, we've, we've created a kind of contradiction by closing schools um, in many settings, not everywhere, but, um, and so essentially forcing childcare responsibilities on parents, and then it turns out to be mainly female parents. It's the mothers who do most of this. So we've had a big economic impact. People who've had to leave their jobs because of COVID have been disproportionately women um, and, uh, um, and leave them to do childcare because the schools are closed and so forth. Um, the learning online is extremely unequal in that context because of the facilities that people have and so forth. So um, there has been a kind of uh, reluctance to reopen schools for fear of infection. I think there needs to be clarity that it's really important for children to be in school and um, not to place the whole societal burden on uh, parents. But this needs to come with things like prioritizing vaccinations for teachers. To say you have to go back to meeting in person, but you can't get vaccinated is crazy, right? So if you want to ask teachers to be meeting their students in person, get the vaccines to them. And that's entirely possible, the same way we vaccinated, we prioritized healthcare workers. Um, there are other learnings about education. I won't try to go into great detail, but I, I think the, you know, the questioner was kind of absolutely right that there are a bunch of negative effects. I would stress there are a bunch of very unequal effects that work well for some and not others, and we should monitor them. So I'll just speak for the US because things are different, although the, this is pretty widespread. We have radically unequal educational systems. Um, part of what the pandemic should be showing us is the need for more inclusive education, more access, um, and um, access at similar quality to more people. Uh, this is the only way we produce educated publics and the only way we produce enough expertise and so forth in all of that. So we really need investments in education. Um, and I will say for the US, investments in public education. 
Um, the U.S. had a really good record on improving public education from the end of World War II through the 1960s, and then it began to deteriorate. Um, and um, the public investment went down, private money was required, the fees paid by students went up and up astronomically, so they're 60 or $70,000 a year at some places. Inequality increased. Um, we need to, to worry about this, and that's coming on universities, but in various ways with secondary and elementary schools too. Um, some countries have much more egalitarian systems, more centrally funded. Um, the question about populism is not totally unrelated, but let me answer it in a different way. Um, Are you, you mean you're moving on to Diane's, Diane's, Diane's question. question? Yes, okay, that's very good. That you, you suggested. The, um, and she nicely says medium term. Of course, populism is there before. And I want to stress populism is not always bad. Um, you mentioned earlier, Asaf, the founders of the United States, these Republican thinkers. Well, they thought all democracy was populism. Um, and then a few others said, well, no, you can have democracy without destabilizing the government. Um, and the pattern of US history has been to have more democracy continuously. All right, so the Constitution said not only that slavery would be tolerated, but that women could not vote, and even white men could only vote if they owned a certain amount of property. <laughs> right? Well, it's partly through populist movements that we have expanded democracy through the so-called era of Jacksonian democracy, the late 19th century populist forward. So our current discussion of populism tends to imagine it's all bad. It's all the crazy people who stormed the US Capitol. It's not those people who are saying, hey, we're being hurt by the financial system. We need something better. Um, so there's a, another side to populism in this. I think of a lot of that kind of populism as a response to the failures of um, government and the excesses of private capitalism, pushing for more democratic solutions. In general, populist mass movements tell you there's a problem. They aren't very good at telling you what the solutions are. Um, and so, you know, pointing out the problem needs to be taken seriously. But then there also need to be thinking about what's better solutions than just storming the Capitol or voting for Donald Trump um, or believing in QAnon. The pandemic has increased generalized insecurity, which increases the impulses of populism. Leaders have seized on the pandemic to be more nationalist, which has often involved them in playing somewhat populist cards to their audiences. You, know, you see a president like Macron in France, who is in no sense really a populist, right? He's an investment banker, he's an anarch, he's a part of a certain kind of elite, um, but he finds it politically advantageous to develop a kind of populism light both to counter the, the um, Le Peniste and to um, you know, develop supporters. So over time, he's in fact helped to fan the populism um, in various ways and what it would mean. Um, and I think the move, uh, you know, Diane Sunar says move towards autocracy, I would say move towards varying forms of authoritarian, highly centralized government. Um, some places absolutely autocratic, dictatorial, some places, um, not so completely, but the trend is powerful. And if we don't respond institutionally, we re end up getting populist responses and short circuits. Uh, uh, you know, we're really out of time, but maybe oh, no. uh, you can very briefly, you know, uh, Alan Duban's uh, dear friend, uh, can you say something about different potential impact of the pandemic on the ge various generations, young and old? I enjoyed your talk, thanks. And then there was another question here. Let me see. Question on nationalism from how can you? Uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, no, uh, from Daria, which uh, says, "Thank you for the great talk. How has the pandemic affected the global talent competition?" Mm -hmm the global competition for talent. Is the US okay. losing its magnet position for the researchers aside? So you have Alan, 
and then you have that yeah and then we close we, we were okay an hour, and i'll be quick the, with each yeah. these are not yes or no okay. questions unfortunately but i'll try yeah, to be. i know i know i know we'd love to oh. have you so you promised you promised me that we'll do we'll make you know you and i could turn it into a into a zoom show you know you and i we, we come out and uh, on a regular basis uh, we one once a month once every fortnight there we come out and we talk why not okay Go ahead. Okay, the Dilgi ASU dialogues. We're starting exactly, to exactly. Okay, um, let me try to um, answer Alan quickly. To say there is differential generational impact, um, and lots of complicated ways. Obviously, older people have been much harder hit by this than younger people in terms of actual death. Um, the economic impacts have different impacts on generations. I think some of the worst impacts will be felt by people who are just entering the labor market now um, or entered it just over the last five to 10 years. They are not the people who are dying at high rates from the disease. They're people who are losing ground economically at high rates due to the recession. And that will have a long-term impact too, because as the market recovers in two, three, four years, um, new entrants, will do better than people who have been around for five years and need to get different or better jobs. Um, there's a long track record of that. We see it even in universities. Um, we may sometimes think we could do better, but we always tend to like the potential of the new young person more than we like the experience of somebody who has been teaching somewhere else for three, four years in temporary contracts. And so we've created globally, as well as nationally, a kind of, um, class of, of academics who have a hard time getting into permanent positions, good permanent positions. And every time there's a downturn, there are more of those. And when there's an upturn, we are quicker to hire um, the recent PhDs. Um, but it's not just academia. Something like that works throughout the economy. So there will be a very hard hit generation um, there. And this is continuing a trend that was already going on. It's harder for young people to um, buy houses or to get into um, a ladder of more financial security. So we're splitting and that. Um, the, uh, what's the other question? I've now forgotten what the other question you wanted me to answer was. Uh, uh, wait, wait, it was about the talent. Uh, uh, the global talent. Global talent okay, competition. So I'll answer that together with Hakan Yilmaz's question about nationalism, that these that nationalism distorts the global talent competition. Yeah. So I think um, by and large, this is playing into nationalist movements, but even before the pandemic, we were into a wave of nationalist movements. A big question is whether we make nationalism a force for including and overcoming our problems domestically, or we only let it be international competitiveness. Um, with regard to the talent competitions, same thing. We should be investing in education in ways that builds talent domestically in more and more inclusive and egalitarian ways. We should make our national loyalty the basis for stronger national education systems, as well as potentially greater success in global international competitions. The trend towards a kind of global talent pool um, has been growing and some nationalist policies try to restrict it and have for hundreds of years, right? Licensing requirements. You can't be a lawyer or an accountant if you haven't gone through usually very national licensing requirements. And, and there are lots of others. Even within European Union, it's been very hard for the circulation of educated professionals um, to match the circulation of capital because there are nationalist restrictions. Um, and this is an issue internationally. My sense is that the pandemic um, in most areas makes this worse, that the travel bans that you referred to earlier, Asaf, have an impact on that, difficulties getting visas and permissions. So it's harder for the circulation of well-educated and internationally educated people um, to maintain its momentum. Um, again, it's harder for the flows of people, um, educated professional people to match the actual interdependence and flows of money and physical goods. 
Um, and I think that's unfortunate because it also undermines our capacities to understand each other and cooperate with each other, which we need so much. Well, on, on these words, uh, we, we have to close. We Next time we should plan for a slightly longer session, I think, you know, uh, and uh, there were still other questions that we haven't answered. So, uh, you know, obviously with Craig, it is the, the thing is both popular and it's so, so, so pleasant that it's sort of time flies. Uh, I'd like to thank Craig Calhoun, my dear friend, our distinguished guest. We'd like to thank University of uh, Arizona State University. Uh, obviously, we as Bilgi are very proud of that cooperation. Uh, and I, I, uh, I think maybe to say the final word, I shall turn the, uh, the microphone to Asle. Uh, and thank also, you know, the hundred odd people who uh, uh, listened and watched, watched us. We must do it again. I mean, my, my, I think this is, uh, this is a good beginning. So we must, I look forward to it. And let me add the note. This is a kind of thing that both ASU and Billy are good at. Yes. Um, we have the capacities to do this online. We are interested in reaching publics outside of the university. And we are interested in tackling the big issues before us, not yes. just being insular to our academic fields. Yes. Well, awesome. Thank you so much you know, for joining in. Uh, we have more than 120 audience uh, live listening to us. And thank you, Craig, uh, and thank you, uh, Hojam Asaf Savash, uh, for this live, lovely, uh, lovely conversation. So uh, we hope to see you again uh, in the next Global Transformations <laughs> ASU Bilgi Talks, uh, part two. I hope uh, everyone will join us. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.